Today is August the 14th, 2018. My name is Tanya Pincham. I'm with Oklahoma State University. And today we are in the Angie DeBeau room, which is in the Edmund Lowe Library here on campus. And I am talking with Dr. Patricia Reyes de Arte. And uh, her specialty area is serial chemistry. And this is going to be part of our STEM area and women oral history project. So thank you for coming today. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Let's begin with learning a little bit about you. Uh, when and where were you born? I was born in Mexico, in a city, the second largest city in Mexico. Uh, the name is Guadalajara. And I was born in April uh, 2020, my goodness, 1954. <laughs> Um, a very large family. I'm the second in the family of uh, nine siblings, or, well, nine altogether, eight siblings. And how many boys and girls in, in that? Four girls, five boys. Pretty balanced then. Yes, woman power dominates them. <laughs> <laughs> and tell me a little bit about your parents. Uh, they're both, um, they, they were born not in that city, but the whole family came from a, a state, uh, two states away from from the state where Guadalajara is. The name is Jalisco, and the whole family migrated. The it was also a large family. Some of them had been married, and they decided to move from a small town to a larger city, the capital of the state, because their business was transportation, and the whole family. Uh, participated in they thought that it would be much better to have um, the business will grow in a larger city and very interestingly like as a tribe they went they moved together and we lived very close by the center of course was the house of my grandparents and then my my father's brothers and sisters lived all close by made visiting really easy Yes, <laughs> and Sunday's very fun. <laughs> and uh, tell us a little bit about your schooling, ele early schooling, like elementary. And elementary school was right there in Guadalajara, and it was in a, in a very pretty area because the, the neighborhood we moved in, it was new, and there was a lot of parks. So I really have to walk through maybe, I don't know, eight blocks and then through a park and straight to the school. So I thought it was a nice, very nice and very pretty school. It was, um, at that time, the, it was a lot of emphasis in, um, culturally emphasis in dances from Spain rather than Mexico. So yes, I know because I think the main reason is in the neighborhood, there were a lot of people from Spain and then their daughters were practicing those dances and then they would teach us. And it was easier because when you have a teacher that does the job, then the other ones have to be fetched or found, find. So it was a lot more emphasis. And I remember later I realized that everybody else was dancing something else and we were more of, of, of the, the old country. Still fun. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. Well, did you have a favorite subject early on? It was always, at that time, it, the books were not as readily available. So a lot of the things that they presented to us, it was either by explaining, we have to write, we have to, to later remember and repeat. And I think I, very early I was interested in biology. And uh, also, I, I was also interested in physics, or at that time, I think not know exactly that it was physics, but more on the physical world. Had you gotten that from either either parent? Were they interested in that sort of thing? Uh, yes, both of my parents are interested in, in medicine. They, they didn't study medicine, but they, when they, the, the main reason also that they moved is they lived in a smaller country, a uh, smaller town that did not have a university. The highest, um, it was elementary school, no, um, 
high school. And in order for them to study at the university, they have to move to the capital of, of the state, which was not that far away, but it meant that the kids have to live alone in, you know, either by themselves or with a family. And it turned out that they went to study alone and it didn't work very well. It didn't work out as planned. And my dad said that he didn't want us to be in a place where we have to go to study to university, to another city. So that was one of the, the reasons, not only business, but also education. So my mother was, if you wish, the most sturdy physicians, a physician in my life because she would know it or invent or make a, a case of what was happening. And she will take care of everything that, for example, when you fall, when you have physical accidents that most of us did at that time, she would take care of you and she would say, and don't cry. <laughs> um, and later I learned how to take care also of my, my siblings and I learned from her a lot of how to take care of wounds or bruises and things like that. And of course the most common ones would be for newborns where digestive system illnesses, that I did not learn very well. But everything else, I think her figure was very important for for the whole family to be very bound. And for her, it was very important to participate with us in homework. Mm -hmm. So it was a, like a family thing to do homework. And my homeworks were always awesome. I have magnificent memories of things that I did with my mother <laughs> that required, for example, maps, production, uh, statistics and things like that and she will she will encourage me to do everything and everything better every time so I was very proud also I did beautiful hand um, I don't remember how we call those things but you we have a session where we do embroidery uh, knitting things like that so my last my on the sixth grade it was uh, a complete tablecloth with napkins. Of course, I didn't finish at all. My mother had to say, oh, how much have you done? Oh, let's do it together so we can finish. <laughs> but we finished it and it was just awesome. I remember because it was displayed among everybody else's, of course, but I thought that mine was very pretty. And where had she learned to do that? Very interestingly, from her mother but also from her grandmother on her mother's side. And she said that she was in the, in the, if we were to see what my grandmother did and her daughters did, my grandmothers were, were many, many steps above. And when she would come and visit, she would say, oh, but you don't do these things very well. Your mother have not taught you these yet? <laughs> And also, when you're doing um, any of these, what I call manual labor, uh, embroidery, this thing, hand work, close this, hand work, yes. Yes, you have to be organized not only what you're doing, but your tools and your, your items that you're using. So there was an emphasis that I had to have organization of the tools too, because that was one of the things that her grandmother pointed out that you have to be careful also with your materials, not only with your end product. You have to be organized. And those skills carry forward today, I would assume. Some yes, of them. but something happened to me when I was growing up. Um, I saw that my mother worked too much. I just thought that it was just too much work. Being a mother on those days, so we're talking about 50, 60 years ago, um, she had to do a lot of more things that now we have machines or uh, more convenience items. Mm -hmm. And I, I, just, I just remember that I have to help, obviously, a lot, and I have to be at the kitchen a lot. 
and I develop more interest in science rather than learning. I could have been a great cook, and I'm not. I could have learned my mother's best recipes, and now what I've done is like scientist. We do it together, and I write the recipes, and then I make it, and then uh, she will tell us because we do it usually Christmas. Um, you let it dry too much, or you you needed to wait until the sauce was a little bit thicker to do the next step. And when I was doing and helping, I was helping, but I was not putting my best interest. And like other activities would be more important because I just thought that it was just too much. <laughs> I wanted to do other things. And now I value um, those activities as well. I just think at one point I, w I was thinking that I didn't want to do those labors. It was to me work. While if I was doing some other things that I liked, they, they were not work, they were more fun. So I split and some of my sisters, they bloom in this area much better. They have a, a more balance homework, I mean, uh, not homework, but both um, duties as a student and then as a helper at the house. They balance them very well and they do them very fast. Maybe that's why I didn't like it because I was not doing them very fast. <laughs> so it took a lot of time. And recently, not that long ago, my mother told me, it, it takes you too long. You have to learn to make them fast. And this was a certain task that he said, you're taking too much of your time there. So, you never know. <laughs> Well, of the nine of you, how many went on to college? Everybody but two. All but two. All of them but two. Mm -hmm. Well, that's excellent for that, that large of a family. Yes. yes. One went into business, like my father, in transportation, and he branched in that area. And the other one, um, he liked, he's the best, well, he's a very good cook, best cook in the family. And he likes, um, he started working very early in a hotel in a special events. And now he works in a, he's really everything that you could imagine in a special events. And he likes that because I, I was thinking maybe he can study restaurant management, mm -hmm. hotel management. And then he says, I love what I do. I, I would not like to go back and study and then come back and be the administrator. He loves people and he likes he likes cooking and preparing, inventing and, and making new things. He's a creator. He's so not an administrator. He didn't mind spending time in the kitchen with your mother then. Exactly. <laughs> and when he visits, truly it's a, it's a joy because he cooks things, not necessarily like my mother, but he invents things and they have new dishes and new ways and new everything. It's so, just a joy. And he must do it fast enough. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> I believe that. Now I'm realizing that. Uh, well, it sounds like tasks within the house were not divided by gender. No! Boys and girls did the, the same shit. thing. I have a, a brother number Number five, he, he can do everything that you need to repair on clothing because he did it. He, he knows how to sew in the machine and he can mend things by hand as well. He can fix, I mean, he, he does these things and he's a good cook, excellent. He's a veterinary, and in, in, in a sense, he's probably the, the brother that left because there was not that discipline in the university on the city that we were studying. So he left and went to another university, and it happened like my father didn't want it to happen, and then later he didn't return or return for a short time and then left again. 
but that's life. <laughs> so into high school, did your, did your area of interest change any into high school? I remember that in high school, what we did, um, we moved to another city farther north um, that is called Hermosillo in the state of Sonora. It's in, in the general area of the Sonora Desert, Sonoran Desert in Arizona and in Sonora. And it was a smaller capital city, but it was very open, very, uh, I enjoyed it very much. But it was very interesting because when you go to the north, and I don't know why in this particular, it could be the state, when you're from the south, they remark, probably it's everywhere, they remark your accent, they remark that you're coming from the south. Yes. And truly, I think, overall, they have, uh, it's, it's that they're very proud of their region. And, and they want you to be like them, more cowboy type. Um, their, their food is not as sophisticated like the food in the South. And, but they are very welcoming if you're friends and you're, you're, you're one of them, but it's still that they tell you. And I still with my, my group where we, we graduated from um, chemistry, we still are in contact the generation that studied together and they still say you and you and you are from the south <laughs> and it's not that they're they don't want us to be part but they tell you that you are from the south <laughs> and in particular is when I I truly enjoyed it and then I loved chemistry right away our chemistry professor was just so much fun and so engaging and I remember that in that particular high school, we were boys and girls in a separate group. And the professor knew, my brother and I were, were so close in age and we were in the same group, the same grade. Mm -hmm. But of course he was in the boys group and I was in the girls group. And the professor, when, when he first realized that we were brothers and sisters, will tell my brother, your sister, well, something in the neighborhood that she loves chemistry or something, and you don't. And what would you say about that? Like putting him on the spot. And he tells me this, so I hope that I'm re remembering. He says, that, oh, I'm very proud of my sister that she likes chemistry. <laughs> because chemistry was not his thing. And he was just almost so proud that I did and not him. And after that, I remember physical chemistry when I arrived in, at a university. Oh, I loved it. I just thought it was very nice. And chemistry as well. Biochemistry was also very fun. And I, now that I'm, I'm thinking, all these professors were very, very good teachers, but also they, they kind of gave it all to you and you were part of their class, they made you participate. And no question, we, we were eagerly waiting for them, for, for the biochemistry, and then the, the physical chemistry. And we have a, a, a professor in chemistry, there were like three chemistries, and the same professor that uh, he will in his exams, the questions were very different than what he teaches or was in, in the course. He would say, what happened if this was not the case? And you have to think all the things that would change if what he told us was not the truth or if, if it was not proven that was not correct. Or in chemistry, if that would not hold. And and I remember that we, 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 he would give us all the time that we wanted. And I was done, and I was looking and I said, I know, if they're not done, that means that maybe I should revise them. <laughs> and I revised them. So my, my answers. 
But in general, all the teachers of chemistry were just a lot of fun. And in my mother's, from my mother's side, there was a chemist. And on my father's side, there was a, a chemical engineer. He was not a chemical engineer. He was a hydraulic engineer. And I thought that would be a lot of fun because he will be building large projects. And he went to Japan to do masters. And when he returned, then I visited and I wanted to visit it with him and I wanted to to ask him because I think what it impressed me is that you will learn and keep learning and go anywhere to keep learning and he, this was in already at the university level when you have to choose between chemistry physics and engineering and two things made me change. I was going to be an engineer and I decided a chemical engineer, not a hydraulic engineer. And the main reason is because my, my uncle told me that industry was not ready for women in a hydraulic engineering because you have to go to very undeveloped places and they didn't want at that time to, to hire a woman that I should choose another branch of engineering. So I sell for chemical engineering. And some friends that I knew when I was already signed up for chemical engineering made me change to just chemistry. And again, for the, the job opportunities that were available. It, now we're talking in Mexico. And I think it was, it was good, but I always thought, or it's in the back of my mind, that I had the mind of an engineer, maybe, because I, I always want to see what seems to be the problem, what can be the solution, or what is the logical solution. And sometimes the logical solution is the simplest, and sometimes there is the one detail that that would not work. In chemistry, it's more, more that you know the principles, and you know that things should be of this direction, or pointing to a, a certain direction. You can make new things, and that's the advance of science has been with uh, development of new elements, new compounds, that will allow us to have the computers, the wearable computers as well. It, it has been for developments that, things that existed, but they were modified, so the function that you want will be faster, better, or a totally new function. And that would be a pure chemistry. And to me, I had the opportunity to decide between food chemistry, or we call it food science and technology, or the chemistry that would be the biological chemistry. Mm -hmm. And I chose the food chemistry just because I thought that microbiology was, was fantastic. And, and the teacher and the, the, the laboratory experiences that we develop were very, very engaging. Chemistry was also very good, but for some reason, I think our laboratories of chemistry were more dry. Uh, it was it was good. I, I enjoy them, and I have my, my friends that we still remember a particular experiment in the laboratory that we did, but in general, that chemistry would have been applied to the the, person, the group that was going into the specialty of um, biological chemistry. And, and I just thought that food chemistry or food science and technology would be, would be more fun. And chose that. And when I finished my, my bachelor's, then I had the opportunity to work with the professor that taught us uh, engineering, I don't remember the exact title, food engineering it, at the university. It, we did, I did engineering projects with him and I, I was his TA on, on the laboratory practices. And I also organized visits to different industries. So 
I was in that area. I worked there for two years as his, uh, um, first was his assistant and then as a, um, I don't remember my title, probably chemist assistant or laboratory assistant. And he, he was also the, the head of the whole group, including the food chemist. And he said that we should improve our English, all of us. And we are going to be teachers and we have to manage uh, very good English, very good comp comprehension, so we can, we can read all that, the material that is available for our, the next generation. And in a summer, I think 99% of the group went to the University of, of Arizona in Tucson uh, to study English. We were all at different levels, but we were a summer intense English program uh, in Tucson. Of course, by then we have a lot of friends in at the university, in the food science department, that we we collaborated. For example, my thesis, the advisor was directly uh, a professor there from from the university, and I did part of my research at his lab, and in the theme that he was specialized, aflatoxins in in crops, especially in cotton and uh, peanuts. And most of us have that affinity with the University of Arizona. So for us, it was logic that we would go there and, and visit the lab as a secondary activity. And when we returned, then, oof, then we, we just jump in a lot of things that we did together. We participated in a lot of competitions in Mexico. And at one point, then we started going to different universities to study PhD with the idea that you would return and teach at the University of Sonora. So um, at one point when, when I decided to study, uh, I was also studying French because at one point I thought, uh, at that point my husband, we were we were just friends. We were studying English. Always, I was always studying English. And then we decided to study French um, with my sisters. So there were the three older sisters with four. So the, the young one was too young to go to, to study French. Well, I don't know. You can go if you're young, but for some reason we didn't include her. Uh, because the three of us were, were at the university. So we were there, we would cross the, it was called French, it was not the embassy, like a cultural office of the French embassy, uh, where they taught the language, they had a lot of cultural exhibitions, movies, we have a movie club, and in general, it was like a social thing. When you went and you took your your courses, there were always things to do in there. In, in there, it was a building, a, a, an old house accommodated for school, for a cafeteria, for a patio where you can relax. It was very attractive or, or um, fun to be in in that environment. So I met my my husband Gustavo there um, studying French and we decided that we wanted to go to France to study graduate school. And at one point um, in the university uh, we invited a professor uh, that was for two weeks in in our city, given us an intense course of what he was teaching at his university. And 
we we were very good friends. We were the ones that we take him for dinner and we talk. Uh, we just were uh, we clicked in things that we had in common. And when we told him that we were going to study um, graduate school, uh, France, and not only that, we already knew what city we were going. And he told us that the majority of the time, you develop a relationship with your major advisor, and you you continue working in things, or it's like a a mentor that is with you the rest of your your career. And it's very important to choose your your mentor. And he obviously he said. France is too far away from Hermosillo. <laughs> and he said, have you thought about um, looking for universities in the US? And we frankly say, no. It was the lure to going to France, it was stronger. And then he said, I'm going to um, find for you what are the things that you like to do? I'm going to find for you a city that would be good for you, both of you to study. His area is, uh, was architecture. And uh, he came with um, three cities as possible candidates. And we, we arranged that we go and visit the university and the professor and see if we would like to study there went to three cities and finally we decided to go to Lincoln, Nebraska. And this professor that I was going to go to study came as a professor also giving, but he was only teaching for one week. He accepted me as graduate student. And you and Gustavo can come and I remember when he first came and then we visited his university, Nebraska Lincoln. So he took us from, from uh, uh, pick us at the hotel and take us to, to a tour of the city, a tour of the university, and then here is my lab, meet my students, my graduate students, and then Gustavo will go to the architecture, and we like it. And that's how we ended up studying at Lincoln, Nebraska. Or what, were the other, what were the other two cities? The other two was uh, Texas A&M. A little closer to home. Uh-huh. And in uh, uh, close to Idaho, uh, it was University of Washington in Spokane, Washington. Beautiful. The area is fantastic. And we also went to to um, Idaho in that trip. We liked it. But the, the, what we were looking is the city where both disciplines will, will be best. And a larger city was better. Uh, Lincoln, Nebraska was better than the uh, architecture department was very good. And in, in that period, then we, we developed this love for when you, when you are in graduate school, you really have all this free time to learn what you're supposed to be learning there, but you also can go to cities, exhibitions, and participate in a lot of things. It, we signed up for, I don't remember what was the name of the, the, the equivalent to our uh, Seratine Center. It was a huge, theater and there were a lot of all kinds uh, theater music uh, performances dances and we were we were the hostess so we were very handsomely dressed every time that we had to see it or different things that we were assigned and once that you you were done with your job then you would sit and enjoy the 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 piece, the, the presentation, and I remember very well. I had a, a test, I believe, two two days after the presentation, 
and I have to see the professor that was and his wife that was giving the test and he said don't you supposed to be studying for the test <laughs> and I said I have plenty of time and then doing that on a community like Lincoln then you start making a lot of friends not only of the students that were doing that job the hostess but also with the professors and in your advisor group um, the graduate students we we have made friends for life it was a fantastic time well along the way were there any female professors yes yes there were female professors in lipid chemistry yes mm -hmm. I think he was the only one in Lincoln, Nebraska. Yes. Uh, when I went for a postdoc in, uh, I studied master's and PhD at Lincoln, Nebraska. And then a postdoc at Purdue University, my advisor was a female. Okay. And there were two female professors uh, at that time at Purdue University. Or were there very many female students like in your classes? Always. Always. So. Females are the, the largest percentage. Like 55, 60%, always. But then you always see that. And I, I was not, uh, I knew because my, my uncle had told me that they were not hiring in, in, in that branch of engineering women in that they saw the branch of engineer and they would prefer a man. But I was thinking that when I would arrive to the United States that I would see a lot more um, administrators and professors, female, um, on those leadership roles. And they were still less than than is today. Then I went to um, North Dakota State University in Fargo and we were two female professors and two, two oh, there was in that uh, department was the department per se belonging to the state and the USDA laboratories and in the US laboratories there were more female I, I would say the majority than male so there is something to be said that uh, there is an effort on the USDA organization to have representation of, of female leaders and researchers. Do you think that's because it was food related and they associate food with the... the it could be because outside. in nutrition, um, it might be in the nutritional sciences department, there were more female than male. Is it today the same way? In, in my, uh, in food science, mm -hmm. I would say that we're making a lot more progress, but we are not representing the same percentage. We're still, still lower. Females are lower. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Overall, uh, if you, you see it across the United States and across the universities when I go to my professional meetings, and very interesting. In the organization that represents the serial chemists, um, it's an international organization. It is started as an American organization, but now it's truly an international. The majority of the leadership positions were male. And it changed, and there were very uh, dynamic uh, leaders that I met through the organization. And I remember telling one of them because I admire her. And I told her, invite me to your, to your uh, activities because I want, to, I want to participate. And she did. She did invite me. She was not from my own university. And when she had uh, presentations or going to uh, prepare workshops, she invited me. So we kind of form a group of a good balance, male and female, on of what she organized. Very interesting because I believe sometimes um, we may see 
that we're competing like everybody else for resources, brands. Mm. But I think we have more in common than what we were competing for. And I think when we we take the initiative and we say, I want to be part of your team, that it, it makes a big difference. I have formed a lot of teams during my career that we have achieved much better and much um, the sum of the parts is better than what we could have done by ourselves. And, and I'm very proud of all of my participation with teams because we support each other and we give the other one what it would be missing. At one point, we wanted to publish in a magazine at that time. The magazines would charge you, they still they charge you, but much more than ch they charge today. And I have to ask one of my colleagues, could you pay half of the fee, which is about this much, it would go to another journal, but we have to pay more. So he had to check and he came back. First he said, of course I would. So let's, let's try. But I have to check all the things that I have to do. If it's, if it's gonna be on time, what we want. And yeah, everything was done as, as fast as we thought it was needed. But also in other groups that we didn't have the same uh, disciplines that we complement each other and we were able to do things because we we made the effort and we identified ourselves and we say let's work together on this so we actively search and look and ask somebody to work with you that's my one thing that i will always recommend to to the new generation don't wait until somebody asks you you have the initiative and you identify um, it's something like you have to feel good about your team your members of your team if you choose them for complementary disciplines not totally apart but also you ask and you ask for forming these um, otherwise if you wait until they ask you they may be thinking that either choose somebody else or maybe you would be busy or who knows. I mean, that head of everybody is a mystery. <laughs> and the team could be a mixture of male and female. Yes. Whoever's best uh -huh. pick, pick for the one you need. Exactly. Yes. And you always pick the one that is the busiest. <laughs> the one that's what? That is the busiest. The busy though. <laughs> because you know that they are they're going to do whatever it takes to do the job. Hmm. That's a good strategy, I suppose. <laughs> well, in Mexico, were any of your professors female? No. no. But you're... Oh, you're... wait a second. I have one. One professor. The statistics professor who was a female. Yes. But the, your mentor from from there oh, saw. Yes, saw I'm sorry, I just remember two, two of them. Okay. Yeah, in in um, in my bachelor's degree, uh, the laboratory, both were the laboratory in charge of the laboratory, and the statistics professor. I was just trying to dis to see if there was any role model, female role model, as you were coming up. Mm -hmm. so this is pretty. I remember reading her Mary Curie in the French uh, chemist that discovered radiation. I remember reading about her and learning all the troubles that she had for being accepted as a female chemist. And I think she's my role model. Okay. And I remember going to her home and visiting and feeling <laughs> very proud to be a chemist like her. That makes sense too. Well, and at least your mentor in Mexico saw your potential and encouraged you to go mm -hmm. on. Yes, and I, I, I think all of us have potential and all of us will, will 
do the best we can. And sometimes some of your circumstances that either you find, maybe your family needs you for something and you know, you feel the, the responsibility that you would like to do something, but prefer not to because you want to do something else. But I think on my generation, they were fantastic chemists and they are fantastic chemists, but they chose to be close by home or they, they wanted to do this as, as their career. And probably I was kind of loose, <laughs> not tied to, to a lot of things that were more, if I, probably I would have say, oh, I'm the, the second daughter and the, my first, uh, the first one was my brother and then me, so I have to be here to something. I'm very sure I can come up with a lot of things that I could have done, but I didn't. I just wanted to learn and keep learning and keep learning. And up to now, when I, I'm learning of other things, and I, I, I say, oh, I would have studied that. Astrophysicist, oh, I would have loved to be an astrophysicist. And sometimes when I learned of the, just pure physics, and I said, I was so close to being a physicist. There are a lot of things that, that sparks your interest in, in. Sometimes what you decide is it's just because you, you put your heart and you want to do it. And sometimes you want to decide to, to have the responsibilities that you choose. And my, my students, for example, that, that I have had fantastic students and I can see right away where their strengths are but I have then saw them bloom in a different area that I thought that they were lacking and, and then I said okay this person is ready and is going to be doing fantastic things one of my first female students graduate student uh, when she returned to Thailand she moved so fast in the ranks of administration. And then she said, I'm done with administration. I want to go back and be a, a teacher again and a researcher. And, but I, I can tell because she was a, a, a firm leader, that, that leader that is sweet but firm. And, and she, she had a strike of leadership. And believe it or not, I, I believe that instead my my style at one point I wanted to be in administration leadership but I'm so glad I, I wasn't because I feel that I had the liberty to learn so many other things fulfill the, the expectations that are from you being a faculty member of this branch and you expected to perform and, and give this on your what you were hired to but you also learn so many things around. And then you you meet in, in a particular uh, expertise. You go to their particular conferences and they learn much more from them because it's not my serial chemist group. And I have learned so much from going to these other conferences that are more physics and chemistry related. Um, that That is, is, is a thrill to go and learn and, and be learning new things. Of course, when I go to my serial chemist, food chemist, it, it, there are a lot of new things that I learn, but this one is like a big jump for me in this direction. And some of those you might be able to bring back to your serial. Exactly, exactly. You say, if this is going on a pure, um, fundamental point of view, I can apply this to, to food science as well to serial chemistry in particular. That's probably a good place for you to explain what serial chemistry is. All right. In serial chemistry, we study not only the composition, chemical composition of your all cereals, all the grains that form the cereal family, but also how that composition interacts when, when you have a composition and you then make a product that composition influences how it behaves on a larger scale. 
and then the interaction of those compounds in making new products. Then physics starts to kick in because then those products need to be, to have a shelf life. They have to be nutritious, you have to preserve by processing, you have to preserve the value, intrinsic nutritional value that they have in order to find that the end product has those uh, attributes or you enhance them by processing and now you make a better product than what you started with. And each, each cereal grain has not only the composition of the proteins, which are extremely important for their functionality, but in some grains like rice, the most important compound that you're interested in is uh, mm, carbohydrates, which is in all the grains, in all the cereal grains is in a larger proportion. Carbohydrates are, the proteins are there in a smaller percentage, but you don't want them to express their, their functionality. You want the starch to dominate. While in the majority of um, wheat, barley, and um, my goodness, uh, I came blank, but the third one that I forget, you want them to study a lot their proteins because what, what makes the participation of the proteins in final products so unique that it is not in corn, maize, uh, rice, uh, millet, or uh, sorghum. And the fa faculty that those proteins have of forming long polymers in a stretch, contract, that's elasticity, or uh, being a, on a viscous, or flowable matter. Um, that is very important and, and you study how they behave when you're making them in processing, when you're baking them with heat treatment and in the storage uh, shelf life. Mm -hmm. And of course, throughout those steps, you want to preserve the nutritional value or enhance it. So serial chemistry involves a lot of disciplines, not only chemistry, a lot of biochemistry because you need to understand how they arrive Genetically, you arrive to a, an improvement of the quality of, of cereals, and then you have to process them, physics, engineering, and then you have to preserve the nutritional value, nutrition. Uh, you have to know the, the importance of those nutrients in the metabolic uh, system of a human and animals, and it involves all disciplines. And a very important, throughout is the, the food safety aspect. Mm -hmm. And food safety is weaved throughout every single step. And now it's more important because we, we need to, to be sure that food safety is preserved and then there's no danger of, of uh, food microbial contamination or other chemical contamination or physical contamination of your foods. It, it has become a very important field in food science, and it has grown. And now every single entity that has to do with growing, transporting, processing, producing, distributing, uh, have to have a food safety regime that ensures quality. So my discipline of cereal chemistry, it, it intertwines with or it, it has interactions with a lot of disciplines. But one of them that is the one that I chose to be more involved, it has to do with the study, the physical behavior when you make the products, when you start making this, in the case of bread dough, that has to be subjected to a mixing regime and then fermenting them, so using uh, yeast, to leaven the products or chemical leavening. And then uh, how it behaves doing baking, which is a, a whole other the stream physical change. And then this, the shelf life. Throughout of these steps that I mentioned, physical changes happen to the components. 
and my my interest has been in in proteins because they are the ones that are so fascinating very different from the, all the other cereal grains and I have chosen to, to follow the physical changes and study the, the changes in all these steps by studying the geometry of, of the rheological changes of the matter. What means what geological changes we we understand that we are deforming what we have and we are studying the structure by deforming it and then see how it reacts. And then we can make assumptions of what is happening at the molecular level. And it has happened many times that we can study them composition-wise um, from the chemistry point of view or biochemistry point of view. But then when you have these large physical changes, you add water and then you have all these other ingredients and you process it. It's beautiful because now you, you enter into more physical deformation. Still has the chemistry a lot to do, but one part of that quality understanding has to do with the deformation, structure forming of the proteins. You study by deforming them and then see how they react and then making inferences and predicting what is going to happen later. So it's a fascinating field and it's something that we have in common with polymers. The proteins that I studied in, in wheat and other cereals uh, form large polymers. And these polymers are biopolymers, not synthetic polymers or organic poly polymers that you can find in, in the seed. The seed that we have right now is made of polymers, soft polymers. Our polymers that we study in food are softer polymers, but at the same time longer size, very much long molecular waist size size. So it's a we learn a lot from polymer science in in the organic chemistry and we apply it to to the biopolymers in our food. Everything that we eat has these properties that we study. Viscosity is when it flows and it forms and elasticity when you stretch where you you like if you have a uh, rubber band and you stretch it, it stains. But when you remove that uh, stress that you put to elongate it, it will come back to, to its original size if it's pure elastic. All the foods that we have and all the cereal, cereal grains uh, have viscoelastic properties. That means they have both and one may dominate more from the other one and there are products that we want to make that we would like to have one of these two dominate more or in a particular direction to obtain a shelf life that we want. And this, this study, this team that I was telling you that I formed where we have uh, interchange of ideas of, of all the things that are needed in order for the understanding of the behavior of proteins, not in a in the grain, not in the dry flour, but when you make the dough, you ferment it, you bake it, and then you, you have a final product. And all of these, we have certain parameters that we like, and we want to understand basic functionality. So then we can say, for this product, we will want more of these, less than that balance of these properties. That's what I study. So do you make a lot of bread? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> yes. And uh, very interesting. Uh, when when uh, one of our practice in the laboratory experiments, when we did bread, I thought it was just so simple. But then when the the process is simple in itself, right? But when you understand all of the things that are going on, it's just fascinating. Mm -hmm. And one expression of, uh, of 
Frank. I don't remember now who it was. I said, are you still baking bread? Like saying, have you not learned everything? <laughs> and I said, there are so many things to learn from bread that will always be baking bread. Because every time you improve something, the final test that we want to see is how does it affect the bread in a standard, we have a very standard method. And you can see, you can appreciate the small changes either by the, it makes a sticky dough or very strong dough, very fluid dough, or the final volume, you can measure differences. You can actually see in the, the air structures of the, of the brain. You can tell, you can see a lot of how the proteins behave by examining that loaf of bread. Mm -hmm. Not only the height, the volume, the outside, but the actual structures that were formed by the proteins. A lot to learn. A lot to learn. And then uh, I have students that were more interested in, in cakes. A lot to learn from cakes as well. And then visiting scientists that were more interested in cookies. A lot to learn as well. And when I was at North Korea State University, I was working more on pasta. And uh, the same thing. In every, in every product, you have all these things and all these systems that you change, and then you want to understand what happens to the quality of the product, the end product. But on the way, you're going to learn a lot. The breeders have all these data that they tell them not only how it behaves on the field uh, against the pressure of illness and uh, stress of, of uh, lack of water, too much heat, not enough heat, hail, all these things, and how the proteins were expressed. The gene code is there, but the environment such, has such a huge uh, influence on how these proteins are expressed that you always have a range of that expression in a range of behavior. So you work very closely with the breeder to understand what is that range. So it's always up or sometimes it's, it has to be very uh, in a range that you would be more, the expression is more controlled and systematic. The breeder has selected and selected. So now it cannot be very good one time and very bad. At, at, different environmental stresses. So he's looking for that uh, range where it, it's going to be good, it's going to be very good, it's going to be not as good, the environment it will, will lower it, but not with these uh, very high and lows. So um, the expression of that protein and how you analyze it and you communicate with the breeder and say, be careful with this because it's just too high. We need to be sure um, that it's always high. Or um, sometimes I don't even know exactly what what is what, but I would say just this is an outlier, or this seems to be that is too low. Is that is that what you were looking for? And, and there are all these ranges that he he has to select and cross and cross and still crossing until he gets the right uh, combination of agronomical and quality attributes. And our part as serious chemists is work with uh, the end product and the, the last part of these years that uh, he, said he and she has invested in making improved varieties. So at that point it would be the like the uh, companies that make meal or flower picks or whatever that goes on the shelf, they would be more interested in what your end product and your exactly your data. Mm -hmm. Well, I, mean, I guess as well as the wheat producers. They're always very interested because the wheat producers, their livelihood is to grow uh, not only what it grows well in their environment, microenvironment, but also what is good for the industry. There's a wide range of where a, a cereal chemist could work. Yes. 
mm -hmm. various places, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. And then every time you keep learning new things that were not there when I when I was studying uh, serial chemistry. And now we have so many areas that have flourished. That is fantastic. It's, and I wonder um, how my, my students and their students will be doing different experiments. I, I can, can wait to see these great uh, contributions to science uh, because some of these new, the newer scientists have improved radically what we were using in equipment, interpretation, and simply by having a, a faster computer can make a big difference. Acquiring data that before, um, I'll give you an example that can give you a flavor. When, you, when we have theory that governs matter, most of the time you have to make small changes to the structure. You learn a lot when you make a lot of changes, but you have to use different uh, models and different instruments. And the instruments that are now available for me <laughs> to use, I was just dreaming when I was uh, studying in my bachelor's degree. Now, truly, I can bake in one a small, in an instrument that has a small area, that has everything I need to give me the change from dough to baked product in one place and acquiring all this information. But of course, what I, then I have to is do is the interpretation of all that and the synthesis of all that to extract as much valuable information. So there is a lot of things. I depend on the improvement of optics and uh, keeping, acquiring information, processing, the models, the physicists to make new, better products so I can extract information from processes that take place in food chemistry. How do you keep up with that technology? You make good friends of your other people that are developing and you tell them what you need and, and you work with companies that are open and you say, this is what we need in order for us to advance. We need to modify the structure much at much higher stresses that we have been. And then we can compare what we've been doing and, and see what information it gives us. We have done that with, it, with a company and a group of us trying to make improvements. So sometimes it takes years and years and years until you find something and then you want to see if somebody else will make more changes and more uses and make um, make adaptations of that method for we may have it use it for hard rain, winter weeds and this is the method for for that new technique in this range, but there are weeds that it would be very soft, much more softer than what we did, or much stronger than what we did, and it requires to change the method, adapt the method, so you are within range of what you were studying. And when, when you change that, the type and the range of your, your, your other products, you have to also have ways to separate them because we think these two soft, soft, very soft and extremely soft and the other extreme, there are levels and you want to be sure that your method and your extraction of information can separate them. If they are blunt or cr crumb, you cannot see that separation. And that is so common. You have a good method for X and then your sample was heated more than the rest, and now your the separation is challenging because in this area, all of this clumped because there were changed with the heat. And now you have to have another method that would make the separation better. So every time you do, you are studying something, there is nothing static or something that it has to be like this, because in order for you to advance, you have to separate those properties, adapt them what you have, not only before you process them, but like the example that I gave you, 
products that have been heated and now you want to separate and compare them with the ones that were not heated, um, you may think, oh, nothing has happened here. A lot is happening. It's just it all cramped because of physical changes that occur. So every time you're, you have to understand what the, the information in front of you is telling you and you have to say, what if this is happening? That's why it occurred. Or this, so we have to prove all hypotheses that in order for us to see a better separation, we need, we know how to separate them, but it was due to X, Y, Z from here. And then now we have to go step by step and see what happens on that separation and how it's affecting. And then you make a story with, which sometimes the story is so simple, you say, of course, how come you did not know that before? It's so simple. It's logic, right? You should have learned it before, but it, it takes time. And sometimes um, I remember when I was reading a book and it was the Dalai Lama and uh, something about, I did something, I don't remember now the title, but the, the point is that it says that we think that we're advancing a lot, but we're just advancing so small, but we are, we're trying to make sense of our advances in science. And we kind of say that we've done these wonderful things. Um, we have to, <laughs> even though the, the steps are very small, um, we have to, to say that this is an advance. And sometimes we publish with those small advances, but that is important because it, it will make an understanding even if it's smaller, a better understanding of what we have, even if it fail to demonstrate something, and sometimes it's so embarrassing to say, we did not see what we expected because it's almost like, oh, you should have designed a better experiment. But if, if they accept it for publication, it's, it's important. So you know that you're not supposed to do that now. Um, Sometimes you tell this to a number of people, but the more number of people will learn that this will not work in this way, they will make advances faster. So sometimes, you know, this is again something that I, I, I regret. I have said something, that, oh, we blow. We think that we're making a big advances, but we're making small advances. That might have cost me a job that I said, oh, we want to say that um, our advances are a lot. But I, I think I was under the influence of the Dalai Lama <laughs> book. I think it's something about happiness, so the title of the book. And I was applying it to everything else because I, I lived that, what I was learning. But now I said, no, we have to those little steps advances, we have to present them, demonstrate them, publish them, and, and placing them in the light of, now we know better that is, and then we can say a chronology, and we are right here, and then this is what we don't know. Even though we have not made this huge step of uh, a very important theory, you know, discovery of this important matter. Small advances are good. Well, in your 30 years, it's been, I was trying to do that, it's been 30 years she, since you got your PhD, right? Yes. 1988. Yes. I think. 1988, right? 88, yeah. So 30 years. Yes. Beautiful 30 years. Yes. It sounds <laughs> like it. In 21 years here at Oklahoma State University. We should probably talk about that. How did you come to be here at OSU? Very interesting. Um, in Oklahoma State University, they have a, and I think it's, it's a national um, program, where you identify people that will be, might be interested in, it's almost like, encouraging leaders, leadership, something was the program. So would you like to participate in this leadership training? It's a, 
I don't remember, I think it was like a week or X number of days. It was not two days, it was a good number of days. And of course I wanted to go, right? <laughs> and I met all, it was very good. Our group, we were divided in, I believe, three groups. And um, not in my group, but in the second group was Dr. Brad Carver, the breeder from Oklahoma State University. And at that time, the Robert, well, now it's Robert Emker Food and Agriculture Center it was being built. And, and during our presentations, you know, because it was a fun way to learn leadership through presentations. And he knew that I was a serial chemist working at North Dakota State University with wheat. And then he said, oh, Patricia, do you know what we're trying to do in, at Oklahoma State University? And frankly, I didn't. And then he said, this building is going to be working with um, adding value to the, the agricultural products. Would you be interested? And I said, sure. So uh, he, he gave me a little bit more information, but sure enough, when we returned, then he sent me clips of the newspaper. He sent me uh, links to things where they were, the advance of the construction and things. So he kept me informed of what was um, happening. And when it was, uh, it was time to say, apply. So he really encouraged me to apply. And uh, I came for the interview and th this was April and we had um, a blizzard. <laughs> I came from North Dakota where blizzards are normal. And when I came for my interview, it was a blizzard. <laughs> Uh, I remember that one of the professors from Brad King Street picked me up from the airport and Brett Carver drove me back to the airport and uh, was your, he was part of the um, committee for, for hiring the serial chemist. What's your impression? What do you think? What is missing? When I came, it was, the building was finished, but it was just the building. I think it were the director and two more people working uh, that we're hiring probably a fourth person but it was only desks and nothing it was an empty empty building so to me it was all oh, it's a lot of potential <laughs> so we can build a very good laboratory for for advancing the knowledge of serial chemists and in and, and working with one of the things that you need to know for your your advancing of your program and a lot of things that we can do. I remember too that he asked me a question that I did not know, but he said, oh, you will learn that later. And he was very, uh, I was fortunate to have this group of, of uh, professors that were part of the committee that were very, uh, to me, very enthusiastic about getting a, to hire a serial chemist. They were more enthusiastic than I was. <laughs> <laughs> so it was also, an influence that the dean of the of agriculture in North Dakota State University accepted the position of director here. So there was a connection. And it was a, a connection with that as well because he had been my master's um, advisor. Um, um, Nebraska. So there were a lot of things, not only, I have to give a lot of credit to Dr. Carver for him um, being interested that I would apply and keep me, keep me abreast of all the things that were happening. He recruited you. Yes. Basically. Very effectively. Well, and then your husband would fit in with the architecture program. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we were in in um, North Dakota State University, then he decided it would, for him, his field was better um, uh, teaching of arts in all levels of school. So he participated in um, 
our programs at elementary and uh, high school, not only in North Korea, but in Minnesota. And there was a program very interesting that it was a traveling art program teacher that he would go to different communities where they would not have an art program. And the community in, in North Dakota had the equivalent to what we now have here as a, I think that was called the, the Prairie Center, an art center that is close to the library. They changed the name recently, where they have a, is, it was first um, multi-graphics. Multi -graphics. Multi-graphics now has transformed into uh, part of the university and it has changed name. But yes, the multi-art, multi or multi-graphic, or what did you say? Multi-graphic, but I'm not sure if that's the right. Multi-graphic center. that's right or not. Well, in uh, Fargo, North Dakota, they have a, such a beautiful facility. It was truly so many times more uh, bigger than the, the one here. And they had, it's open not only to the schools, but to artists in the community to work there and to share their work. Mm -hmm. So there is always somebody working. So he participated in there in, uh, in the, the areas that he is, Or his, that he practices in uh, sculpture, uh, oil painting, and printmaking. And I remember when I went there, and it was so many students and so many things going on. And you can see how art makes a, a, a different environment and a different soothing type of experience for me and for the students because I have seen in any community there are students that have more problems than others to adapt to a, 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 a school environment and I have seen those coming from according to the that they are there coming and make art and they are to me uh, very peacefully making these pieces and, and creating and to me, um, it's the part that could be explored more in everybody at all levels and have that creativity that channels a lot of things that because we're not all cut with the same cookie cutter and that, that will make that individual flourish and have the best of their abilities expressed and accomplish something. So to me, the arts are a complement of every individual and every discipline. And it can be arts that you, you I think you call them uh, when you make them with your hands versus you perform them. One is performing arts and the other one is visual arts. Or, that could be, yes. Uh -huh. But all forms of art, including playing instruments and dancing and painting, make an individual more whole and make that creativity is still more expressive than if your art will not be there. So art has been his in art teaching in um, making different parts of, of elementary school science integrated with art to make it more accessible to those that would need that accessibility or, or that have more visual um, abilities or understanding. A more rounded approach to, yes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yes. So OSU's been a good fit? Very good fit. And the community, absolutely. The students have been fantastic. I have been, mm, some students for all branches that had come to my laboratory. And I'm so grateful. It's so great individuals, great learners, great workers, and some of them I keep touch and I, I keep abreast of their careers. Some of them that I'm not 
I'm absolutely proud, even though I just very briefly crossed paths with them either one semester in my laboratory assistant, like a laboratory assistant, so more. But um, I have, I'm very proud. I, I feel like it's part of my, my team, <laughs> my legacy. Well, I'm sure you've been a mentor to quite a few then. Trying to be, and also with my colleagues that I work with. Some of my colleagues, I have, very, I have been very fortunate to have colleagues that have worked with me and they have shared their knowledge to my students and it, it has been just fantastic. Sometimes I think that that combination makes that enriched experience even better than if I would be the one there or my discipline alone. Well, since OSU does a lot of research with wheat, is that was what was that one of the things that brought you here too? Exactly, it was wheat, wheat breeding, uh, supporting the wheat breeding program, and uh, adding value to wheat products. Yes. Well, the new word that you hear a lot is gluten. Are you doing anything with the gluten aspect of? I study gluten. Gluten is my subject of study. Yes. Okay. But also. Uh, even though the, the, the industry is very, very transparently saying our products contain gluten and some, some individuals have gluten intolerance or they are allergic to gluten and that is an immune response from the individual. That means cannot, if it's truly a celiac disease patient, cannot eat wheat, uh, cannot eat gluten, because every wheat product, every wheat component, well, even in the starch that it has been isolated, will have some part of gluten in it, um, will affect that immune response. Mm -hmm. And it, the person is sick when, when eating that um, gluten, that part that affects that response. So those individuals, the best, there is no cure, there is no vaccine, there is nothing. The best action is they will not eat, they should not eat gluten products, wheat products. And the industry acknowledges that, but the rest of the population that are not sensitive to gluten, that are not allergic to gluten, they should not be worried about eating wheat products. Um, but also, we understand that people are willing and want to have gluten-free products made from other cereal grains. We have also worked with that, those products. Because they're made with cereals, they have different properties, they do not have the viscoelasticity that gluten has, so then we have to compensate using different combinations of starches or products, grains. And, and make baked products. But there are two different reasons that you make this choice. One is for healthy reasons, or you, if you're really a, a patient that has an immune response against gluten. Nothing that you can do about that right now. If I am a, a customer that decides Oh, gluten-free product. I wonder what it tastes, and I buy it, and I like it, or I prefer to do to buy this type of product. That is good as well. But what a, we, as scientists, cannot support something that um, without proof is saying, without the the strict science proof, um, it says that gluten is not good. For everybody, that gluten is the, the one that is making sick or is making your brain to function differently. Uh, we, that's what we, we as serial scientists and, and the whole community, we're working to, to prove those claims. And if it's true that that is happening, instead of just uh, having the the individuals or discipline of individuals that are claiming that they should not eat wheat. Mm -hmm. There are people that say they should not eat milk or should not eat, should not eat so many things, but there is not such a thing that you 
you should not eat all these things. I think a balanced diet is, is what we, we and our ancestors try to have a balanced diet. And with that balance, um, if you know that something is disturbing you, causing you problems, you avoid it. I'm the one that had, for trial and error, discovered that I cannot tolerate a particular food, so just avoid it. And I'm pretty sure a lot of the individuals will know. Uh, either you knew it before, you ignore it, or you now are sure. My brother, all of a sudden, he's allergic to a particular fruit, and before he was not. So he made a test that with and without, he said, oh, I'm allergic to this. So I told him, I, I kept to tell him, well, your test, what you did, is empirical in order for you to know that you're in fact allergic to that particular food. You need to be tested. And if you are, you're happy with avoiding it, it's fine. But if you are allergic to that, then now you know for sure. So if somebody has a corollary from this conversation, thinks that is allergic or has a, a different response from eating a food product, they can make their own test by avoiding it, how they feel several weeks and then ingesting it again. I'm sick again, I feel these symptoms. So then they avoid them. If they want to know if they're really um, allergic or have this adverse response, they have to be tested by a physician. And we have the tools, the physicians have the tools where they test your immune response before and after, and they can test your levels. And then they say, yes, you are allergic to such and such. This is when you ingest it because the ones that are in your skin, they're easier, but this has to be ingested. That's just a fascinating. I know. So, so many tangents you can go on. I know. <laughs> yes. And I keep thinking, okay, your mother's in the kitchen and she should be proud of you. Is she proud? Of you? <laughs> she should Always. be proud that I'm not a very good cook, but an okay <laughs> chemist. <laughs> but you understand what's going on when she's cooking. Yes. So, yes. Or, and, and they like, and I also like, when I go and visit and I tell them something in the basis for and they say, oh, you should come more and share your knowledge with us. Yeah. But I like to highlight something or another, like either a level or a food they are eating, the sequence or something, or, or tell them just because I know something interesting. Well, so the, the, correct me if I'm wrong, a serial chemist isn't so much interested in the taste. It is also interested in the taste. taste. We include that as well. In our evaluation of quality, includes um, a taste evaluation. And with breads, important. And with everything, sometimes it's just as important just to study. There is a branch of food science that is a sensory science. And it's just fascinating. Just imagine the industries that have developed a product just because they have done this better tasting and it's making very good, it's accepted. And you probably, you have experienced something that you, you have eaten it before in a certain way and you try this and you say, ooh, this is much better. A serial chemist or a food scientist once there, a chemist most likely. And uh, they made sensory evaluation. It's part of our discipline okay. to test the acceptability and if you, if you detect anything odd flavor or a residual of a flavor. Our, our senses are so sensitive that we can detect the small changes. When we do sensor evaluation, we kind of calibrate your, your palate because you arrived and we give you water and uh, salting without salt. Uh, no salt, saltine crackers that will uh, balance, not that balance, that will make your any flavors that you had before um, 
that will be the baseline. Mm -hmm. And then we'll give you something to evaluate in small quantities. And you will even give you directions of how to try it and what to do and what are we looking for to feel um, valid where we have decided to learn something from what we represented to the, the uh, panelists. Uh, there are some stories on that area that are fascinating, oh, like, sure. like uh, if you close your nose, you don't have that the volatiles that go on your the back of your your throat and connect with your with your olfact, with your olfactory villi that is in your on the back of your nose, and. When you have a cold, it's the same as not having or having that plugged. So you don't taste the same. No. Things don't taste the same. And then you open it, and we do this all the time with, with audiences that are not with scientists or um, workshops, etc., or demonstrations. We give them something close with their nose closed, no flavor. Release it. Ah, it's a strawberry. Or they cannot detect. If you remove the color, by putting just a different color on the room and everything would be the same so you cannot differentiate by color it affects your your perception mm -hmm. and of course if you don't you cannot smell very well it affects your perception fascinating and also the the physically your tongue if you have a lot of the of the taste buds, if you're a super taster or not a super taster, it affects. There are people that can tolerate a lot bitter flavors or bitter uh, products and people that have a very low tolerance. You may have come across people that even the strawberries are too tart for them because they're very sensitive. Or as, as a person develops that, how that taste keeps developing. And now you become more sophisticated, and then you can perceive differences. And um, you may have seen people that say, "Oh, this wine has these tones. This bread has this tone. This tea, oh my goodness, tea in Asia is as as studied and as highly valued as wine in in other countries, or horticulturists that have developed." Varieties because it has a better taste, a better flavor, better color. You taste and taste and taste different ways. <laughs> Meal time at your house must be fun. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, I, was, I was reading that you also have done some volunteer service and that you re received an award in this year, 2018. Uh huh. President, so volunteer presidential award. award and volunteers. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, I. It, it, I have always learned that you volunteer in different scenarios, different types, different activities. I have the the privilege to volunteer in in my area, in presenting seminars, workshops, hands on, uh, and different parts of the world. Sometimes it's through um, my colleagues. They want me to visit the university and present what I do, my research, my topics, all the different things. Or when you are attending a conference in a, another part of the world and then your colleagues say, uh, come and teach in my class and that type of volunteering. But these other volunteering is for longer term when you go and you spend two weeks and give seminar training to people that want to learn on your on your expertise area. So I have done these in Africa, in Mali, and in most recently in Senegal. And the award that they gave me was for my participation with the Senegal uh, workshop that I gave. And it was going and training this school that has women, women are the one that will receive the, the education. Women that have all kinds of walks of life, but 
these women, most of the time, um, they will be the trainers. That's the one that I gave the, the trainer. Train the trainer. Train the trainer program. They mm, will participate in giving uh, tools to women that have, for some reason, have not, that have been widows or they, they need to be employable and to improve this, their skills, they need, they need training. And it is one of the areas that they, they have um, in the preparation of food or working in a company that is preparing food that you tell them your material, your processing, your final product, and if you want to make new products, this is what you need to know, learn. And this is how you're going to calculate how much are you going to combine of these. So it's not just blah, blah, blah. Here's your composition. But the students have to learn to make a new product, calculate if I, I make 15% of this and that, what is my um, nutritional composition of what I'm giving? And if I, I want these for infants, for toddlers, for youth, for the population in general, that they have different requirements in nutritional um, status, uh, you have to be sure that you are making these products correctly. So I teach them all these things and I make them calculate and math by hand or with their phone. Everybody has their phone and they have they able to calculate. And if they will not get it or they will not, that will be slow, I sat down with them and we made the calculations together. Sometimes there was no place for me to sit down, so I have to kneel down and be next to the person trying to do the calculation until we, we get it right together. And sometimes they have a way to calculate things in a certain way that is different than the one I do because I learned it in this way. Mm -hmm. Then I let them do on this way and then I double check with mine and I say yes. So, so you do it they, in this we come up to the same the same calculation. So we practice these, give them homework and in in a, a real scenario that they want to make something. I, I told them what we or not necessarily that I told them but the, the woman that is the director of the school said, we want some hands-on. So when she said hands-on, she meant that I will prepare some foods. And I said, no, she's going to prepare the food because uh, it is better um, that we brought these different ingredients. Most of the women that were there, the majority have either a small shop they were selling or they will make their own, they will have products of different sources and they wanted to make new products. So they will make the product and we taste the product when, when it was done. So I received these for preparing before going there, going there, keeping in touch with, um, my goal is to make an effort to buy them equipment that they don't have at the present time by finding funders that they're you know, encouraging that they, this is a good investment. So I received a, a nice something that looks like a, with my name and a signature that says, thank you for your volunteering and a medal that says volunteer. And it's, it's, it's it's humbling because I know that people are doing much more than what I'm doing. We have a professor here in nutritional science, a very good friend of mine, Barbara Stoker, that he has been working with Africa for years and years and years, and he has this trajectory of doing so many projects with her colleagues in nutrition. And I'm, I'm sure she has received a lot of accolades as well, but uh, it also feels very good that you you receive these, even though you you know it's not somebody's doing so much better work than you and much more in in uh, spreading the knowledge. Uh, 
contaminated, but it feels good. And then it makes you feel that you want to do more. So probably that's why they give us these things. So you can, <laughs> you can do more and more. And it's just, um, it works. It, it makes you feel that, of course I can do more. And you're appreciated, yes. It, appreciation is what you see when you're giving these seminars. And, and it's, it's, it's almost like my friends for life as well. Um, but we're far away, like my professor, like my, my friend told me, when you're far away, things are not, doesn't happen as, as fast and as close. But sometimes I receive phone calls from them. And uh, this um, present that I was given in Senegal when I came, it was a dress, a Senegalian dress with the colors of their, their flag made by the husband of one of the, of the uh, attendees. Of the husband? Yes. Uh, oh, okay. in, in Senegal, men are the tailor for women and men. Because it's, it's, uh, it's very traditional that you, you don't go and buy ready-made dresses. You go and buy the, you choose the fabric and then you tell them what, how, where, color, and they have your dress. Beautiful dresses. It's just uh, make you feel, when I was in my Western attire, made me look like a <laughs> underdressed. <laughs> uh, so they present me with this dress and, and it fit me. And I said, how, how did she calculate it? She didn't come and say, let me see how much is your, your waist because it's tight in here and then it's, it's the, the, the style that they use. So she said, and my husband did it, and said, oh, please tell your husband that I really appreciate it. Next thing, this is when I was leaving, so no chance to meet her husband. So when I arrived, he calls me. He speaks better English than, than her, her wife, his wife. And we had this conversation in English. <laughs> they speak French. I speak a little bit French, so we were kind of whatever I could not explain very well in French that we say it in English, and hopefully we understood. And in another one, also called me. And the same with uh, the group in in Mali, that they had called me or sent me uh, information of what things that accomplishments in their lives. So you feel the appreciation right away. The second appreciation is almost, um, yes, you, you don't expect that because what you were doing. In my case, truly, it's, I enjoy it very much. At the beginning, I had my reservations because I learned something in Senegal that I said, oh, I don't know if I want to go, but nothing that I let, I read was comparing of the beautiful things that I found, the, the, the food, the people, the environment, and everything. So sometimes when you read too much, you, you may have ideas that are not, I think you have to read, be knowledgeable, but not be afraid. Just calculate. Um, almost scientific. Uh, yes. <laughs> I have your doubts, be a skeptic. Yeah. Well, uh, this makes you, it's, it's that one more thing that makes you say, of course I can do more. And of course, this was one time in, in a year. I could do two times. Sometimes one time a year is good because you have so many other deadlines and so many other things. But if you are like Dr. Um, Stoker, she, every break that she has, she accommodates her breaks in such that she gives to, to the colleagues that she works with. Mm. And one can do so much more, so much more. But I, I'm humble, appreciative, and uh, I enjoyed it very much. And who who gave it? To, who was the company? What was the? Oh, all okay. right. <laughs> the the knowledge we came from the office of the president. That they have, uh, they give every year to so many volunteers. So you have to be nominated by somebody. And in this case was the agency that I volunteered for, which was the um, uh, 
Uh, they are in Arkansas, the Miss Kicks. That tells you that my senior mom needs to kick me second time. <laughs> is the Windrock. Windrock. Okay. Windrock International. And it's, it's a, a complete group with analysts, and statisticians, blah, 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 that organize um, volunteers. They have programs in different countries and then they ask you. Um, somebody has requested an expert in this field that matches your field. Um, can you take a look and see if you're interested in participating? And usually they describe how they, what are the points that they would like to achieve and what are the, they describe the people that will attend, where they are. Particularly this uh, assignment that I accepted for volunteer struck my heart because they were women that had been um, the, the final trainers, we, the, the ones that we receive information on how to prepare food, will be people, women that do not have other educational opportunities. Mm -hmm. And most of the time are mothers, widows, um, they're not young people that can have the luxury to go to school and have a training in this area. So essentially you give them um, a job training, very specific, that they can use it directly in home, what they're doing at their home, but they can also find jobs in the industry. These women that were attending were people that had shops that can hire the woman who they would be be training and then be hired and the president the president of the university or the president of the company the president's award oh who, who was the, i'm so sorry which, the which, president of the united states oh that okay that, <laughs> that president okay yes That's uh the pre this was established by the first Bush president, mm -hmm. where remember the point of light, that point, that. Um, so then uh, they established to give uh, recognition to volunteers for their work on the. Well, that's even a bigger picture than what I just went off. Oh, okay, okay. I, I thought that when. Oh, we're good. <laughs> yes, it was uh, presidential, meaning the president of the United States. I was saying, president of. Oh, the shoes. shoes. Oh, shoes. Why well, I was thinking that. Okay. Bigger level. Higher, higher level there. Higher level. <laughs> okay. And then I was reading that you do some STEM academic summer academies. STEM yes. summer academies. Yes. Can you speak about that just a little? I have the, the privilege to work with these um, groups that are coming in the summer. And usually are other representative uh, groups that. Um, they are they visiting the university and they are training in very disciplines, different disciplines, STEM related. So I have participated in one that is chemistry. And we talk about polymers in your life. So the first part is pure polymers, like in your cars, in your in a everyday life. And the second part is polymers in food, which is the one that I cover. I also participate in other academy, which is uh, other professors that have um, have also high school um, students that are given the opportunity to do hands-on experiments in science. So I give them also some demonstration of gluten behavior or uh, in bread products. But the one that that we have worked very for several years and very chemistry oriented in women. With very, um, the goals is to not only, we have them, I have them a whole day and they are here a whole week. And we give them different examples, different um, hands-on evaluations. They present at the end of their, their week, they present what they have learned and uh, their parents come during a banquet dinner and they tell them what they have learned. It's awesome. 
I don't. Is it boys and girls? Boys and girls. Boys and girls. Right? Yes. Mm-hmm. They're pushing people to get interested in the STEM cells. Yes. Maybe STEM fields. And, and yeah. it's just you just tell them something and they are they are interested. They are too much interested this year <laughs> and they touch everything and did something. But I told them first, okay, that's all right. I'm glad that you tried to learn how what this was this for. It's just that when you did it, you spill the the grains essentially. But uh, then I, I explained them what's the purpose of what we have in there and what was the goal and uh, I explained. But they were just curious, poking, trying to find out. I, I bring them into our laboratories and, and they're baking and they're understanding what happens. They isolate gluten and they see the gluten itself by itself rise, collapse or stem and they make products and then we compare them. It's a, it's a very fun, hands-on experience. I, yeah, I would assume that leaves a good impression or leaves a, a, a really good impression. I wish I could do this every weekend because then you can see in the kids their, their eagerness to learn more. You get excited because they're excited. Yes, yes. 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 In my retirement, I would do that. I would hook up with somebody that will allow me to bring kids during the weekend and learn, teach them, and have all kinds of things. Or you're not planning to retire anytime soon, are Well, you? one day I will retire, right? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe if, if I get in conversations like this, it's, I'm the one, the kind of a person that say, I wish I could just do this much longer. But I think it's also good that, that you, you have liberty to do some other things that will lead you to keep learning and keep sharing with other people. For example, I, when I retire, I will do more of the volunteering to, to go to different parts of the world and share what I, need, I know about material chemistry. And I want to share locally as well. And I want to share a lot because there, the, I mentioned a few minutes ago, the merge of science and art. If we do that, I'm pretty sure it's going to be a blast. I'm pretty sure people do it all the time. But the young people, the ones that, that you want to share things with. I also participate a lot with the Grandparents University. And I have done it for many years where I share with them. And it's so interesting to see that combination of grandparent and grandkid working together and solving things. And having lots of questions, generate a lot of questions. Do you mean this is happening? <laughs> that curiosity. Yes. Yes. Uh, curiosity is science. Yes. Yes. Well, we've covered a lot. Is there anything that we need to that I haven't known to ask? Well, we've covered a, a, quite a bit. Uh, I, I want to share, because we're a library, and, and okay. I want to share this experience that I have. Okay. I was, uh, I mentioned that I was in a, in a new developed area when we arrived to this larger city, the capital of this state. Uh, very um, dynamic. It was growing very, a lot. So when I went, all our assignments can be done in our books at home, but when we went to the library and I opened, I remember the, the big, uh, uh, at that point we have to go and ask for something and find the exact book. And it was quite cumbersome until you arrive to your spot and then see all this knowledge in the books. <gasps> My goodness, I remember saying, oh, I have to hurry. <laughs> it's so much. And I was like, sometimes it was, you have to go and, and find your assignment, uh, Newton's career and uh, accomplishments, or one thing, or, or oh, you can select one person in a particular field that you wanted to talk about. And I remember even uh, flipping before I arrived to my actual page where it's supposed to be, that I was thinking all these people that knew all of this and placed it in here for me, just ready until I find it. 
and uh, I was a point that uh, of uh, admiration and, and I was giving thanks for these things that they were there for me and, and all of this work that happened before me. And I remember when I was then, many years later, that I wanted to find something and it was the end. <laughs> we don't know what is things after this when you arrive to a particular field very specialized and you have to learn from your own and leave it there so in my recapitulation of what had happened between that discovery and then at the point where I was I was thinking that how great it would be if I can leave something so one person that it was about my age and it will arrive and say, he, here is everything that it was known at that time, and then surpass it faster than I did. So to me, libraries and the knowledge and the, the way uh, our, we gather information, it's just fascinating. And it's too bad that my capacity, instead of growing, remembering, <laughs> instead of growing, it arrived to a point that now is forgetting that's all right. I'm ready for the new implant and some chip that will make those connections. But the very place that I admire the most is the library. And now to me, the library is the world and the openness. Right now to me, and then I have learned this through my husband, do you know that you can go when, when it was the first time that happened? that you can go to the library of Queensland or any other place, or Gutenberg, um, and download these books for free. I mean, you download them and you, learn, you can learn them and have them in your iPad. Um, it was like, I was waiting for this. I hope that I, if it exists, that thing that you can come back, <laughs> that I can come back and learn those things because uh, the time and the things that happened to me made me learn at this speed. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking that the new generation, if I have a chance to be a new generation, I will learn faster, better, and probably, who knows, retain in a different way. All these experiences that I have were very good. I'm very grateful, but I'm truly looking forward for the next generation and the new things that will come. And I wish I could participate one more time. <laughs> <laughs> well, for that, for that particular generation, what advice would you have for them? Oh my goodness, yes. I have to, I have a, I have nephews and sisters, nephews and nieces that I, I can see how they don't work as much. My impression, they, I think overall they do work, and they do surprise you. You may think that they're not working as much, and they surprise you. But in my, in my appreciation and the advice is that the speed and the things that are at your at your hands, at your disposal, right now, are a multiplier of what we had before. So make sure that you make the best and that you use them much better, much better. What you're doing right now is just a, a, just a, such a small capacity that you can learn so much more but be a whole person. And don't forget that these are tools and you can learn, but the person that you're supposed to be has to be a complete person with a lot more than just tools. But these tools that you have will make you be so much knowledgeable and your contributions will be so much greater than the ones that the generation before that I belong to that I'm so happy for you. But do be sure that you use them well. 
and just be it's a big responsibility that you have you're going to inherit the world and truly i wish you the best but work intelligently don't be just very selective and you just do the easy part or the easy way hard work will always and intelligent work will always pay much more in uh, making better contributions and leave a legacy much better in a more significant changes than what we did. Okay, and you mentioned legacy. What do you want to be your legacy? What I wish would be my legacy. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I think my legacy is my students. My contribution of what I, I instill on them, uh, it was just something where they can just grow and be much better. Because everything else is just knowledge that can be surpassed instantaneously, almost. Uh, but the people and the, the way uh, they're now in their careers contributing to science and education industry is my best legacy. And those that I touch just peripherally, just on occasions, that I just wish that I can inspire them, even if it's just a little bit more. They're inspiring just by looking at the natural world, they're inspired. But if, if they would say, if this woman did something just by being a chemist and working on their standards, I can do much more by studying this. Um, they are frontiers right now that they're going to live that we don't even dream. Going outside the space, improving what we have here. Every time we go out, we improve our own lives here. And by making these changes on, on the things that we're going to hard have a life, energy, the things that we need for survival out of space will make our life here better. So for them, it's going to be a new frontier and going to be just, instead of us just going to, I don't know, to study to France like I wanted, they're going to go and study to Mars <laughs> or beyond. I think I'm glad that you didn't end up in France. It was a good <laughs> spot for you to come here. I wish you's been lucky to have you. Oh, and it has been so um, good to me and my family. It's, it's fantastic. It's, well, then let's end since our topic was around STEM and women. What what more would you say to young girls that would be interested in in the serial chemistry or math or whatever? In every field of science, we need more women. We, we have, oh, we're equal but, but different because our, our, the way we acquire, the way we reason different things, it's, it's in a, in a more, I don't even know how to place this. Um, we all have different qualities on, on how we learn and how we, we share the knowledge. But the more we have, we're sharing with more women and we tell them um, there is no limit of what you can do. Even though you're role models right now, there are no, not enough women, uh, you keep it going and you keep making the road. Every field of science needs us because we are, 52% of the population worldwide. We, it's, it's a loss that this 52% is not expressed at its maximum in science. That 48% cannot have all the answers and all the, the points of view. Our point of view and our way we bring because our style and our uh, the way we see the world is different, not better, but
but it will complement all of the points of view that we have right now. And our potential is even uh, surpasses the one of male, which will be probably in the more physical and more, um, they, they excel in all disciplines, but they are better in certain disciplines right now. There is no limitation of our strength as a, because we, we do not have the, the same physical strength, but we have our intellectual strength that I'm, I might say is much better. Uh, if somebody says prove it, I would say it's everywhere. <laughs> wisdom of woman, uh, the female wisdom is everywhere in every field and in every part of the world physical, biologically, everywhere. Um, so we need you. We, we want you to be in every field that you were giving your, your faculties to flourish in. We need you. And we need you to make good friends and good teams with the ones that will make uh, your career flourish and your field flourish. And of course, you will have interest around your main field. There is always be that, but form alliances with your team and your people uh, from different universities, different disciplines, and make that working teams that will take you to discover great things. I think we need to clone, clone more Patricias. <laughs> <laughs> there are many Patricias out there. <laughs> well, I've covered all of my topics. Anything else? No, it has been a delightful morning to visit with you and, and share some of my life experiences. Oh, well, thank you for sharing. It's been great. Absolutely great. My pleasure.